in lesson two, which was in two weeks ago, I uh, had a verse of two of scriptures that's probably worthy of our attention again. And the reason I say this, having taught the Bible many years and graduated from Bible school and got out of Bible school and dealt with some of these same things year after year with people, you hear the same thing. Well, you guys are dispensational teachers. That's scaring me. Where did you get a word like that? That's not even a Bible word. No, wait a minute. That is a Bible word. And I like to stop folks right there and go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 17 says this, For if I do this thing willingly, Paul talking about preaching and ministering, I have a reward. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, in other words, there's a breach, a break. Uh, and so the word dispensation chosen by the Holy Ghost, used by the Holy Ghost, preserved by the Holy Ghost for us today in your Bible. It's mentioned again in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. And by the way, the same writer, the Apostle Paul, mentions it every time. It says in verse 10 of Ephesians 1, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. There the word is used again dispensation, that in the dispensation of the fullness, in other words, in the time allotted, in the time space. Okay, it's used again in the book of Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, say, there it's used again, preserved, that we might have it. So we learn from it. It's used no less than one, two, three, four times. I'll give you the fourth one in a minute. But the Apostle Paul uses it every time. And he's the guy that said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he presented a, a teaching factor called divisions in the word of God. And guess what? A dispensation is a division or a divide or a time period or a time slot. Now we'll look up the, the we'll look up the definition of the word dispensation in just a moment, but let me give you the last verse. Paul uses it again in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 25. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So in other words, something was given to God, to, to Paul from God just for him at that time were the people that he ministered. And guess what? He's the apostle to the Gentile, we're the Gentile church, and ye have heard of the dispensation of grace. Welcome to the dispensation of grace. Very biblical terminology, uh, very good for the uh, serious Bible student, very good for the casual Bible student to understand uh, what a dispensation is. So Noah Webster says with the most archaic definition I can find, which would best fit the 1611 text, dispensation, a system of order, government, or organization of a nation even. Uh, and we're getting ready to go into the dispensation of Joe Biden. But you don't hear him say it like that, amen? Okay, uh, community, uh, in your community, especially as existing at a particular time. So the word dispensation lends itself to time allotments. It doesn't have to start at a certain time or a certain place. It just has a beginning and an ending. Now, the chart today, last time we used that chart, last two times, and we talked about the system and how God set the thing up uh, by the seven days in the week with creation, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You had day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, day 7. And we made some comments, run some scriptures, and I'll try not to go back over that. But a system was set up in the book of Genesis using the rule of first mention to the casual Bible student or to the serious Bible student. And around here, we take studying the Bible pretty serious, uh, e even though Hoosier Hills Bible Institute is not functioning right now because of this COVID thing, we still take it serious. So... Sevens, God works by sevens. We said all that last time. So, and we said, okay, now 
man shows up on day six. The number of man is six. We said all that. And now we got day seven and he rested. And so now we start with chart number two. Chart number two, exactly, exactly the first dispensation we call it. And though it's entitled and it's called by scholars and Bible teachers and people in England and America and different places as the Edenic or we might say the Garden of Eden time. And it's the dispensation of what we term innocence. You say, well, how does that lend itself? Well, it's a certain time period from the beginning of man, the creation of man, Adam and Eve, and the fall of man. Now, in every dispensation, at the end of every dispensation, in the beginning of another one, there's always some great big event that takes place that almost earmarks the change in how God is going to deal with that next age. So, this chart has the creation of man, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and then Adam and Eve, and obviously Eve is created from the rib of Adam. We're not trying to teach verse by verse uh, from the scriptures here, but just laying out uh, a, a way to understand the Bible. So Adam and Eve shows up, Genesis 2, 18, 25, and they're created in innocency. They are solemnly warned of the consequences of sin, Genesis 2, 15 through 17, but at this time they have not sinned. And they would be what we would call innocent, or if you please, perfect in body, soul, and spirit. You say, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, they had never sinned. They had no shame. They didn't know what shame was. They had no grief, no reason for grief. Everything was pristine, was perfect, if you please, paradise. And that word shows up again, recorded by the Holy Ghost in the Scriptures. But that's where they lived, in innocence. But you know the story of Adam and Eve Anyway, it's called Paradise, Genesis chapter 2, verse uh, 8 down through verse 15. But then by Genesis chapter 3. And you can watch the numbers in the Bible too if you would. God works on a series of sevens. A lot of things happen and change on threes and fours and sevens. Now, I'll just throw that in. We're not studying numerology so much, more or less in a general form, dispensations. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, pretty important chapter in the Bible. You say, why? Something big happened. You say, what happened? Well, the serpent, more subtle than any beast in the field, shows up and he goes against the Word of God and tells Eve she can go ahead and eat of the fruit. She was forbidden to eat of that fruit, and she does. And say, what happened? Well, what happened? I'm going to tell you what happened. You say, did she get lost? Couldn't find her way back? No. But she's termed lost when this happens. When she disobeyed God, the Holy Ghost of God, the Spirit of God that breathed life into her departed from her. Her spirit didn't leave, her soul didn't leave, and her body didn't change. But God left them. You say, well, what happened? They were in darkness. They had fallen. Listen, when God leaves you, you're in darkness. When God leaves you, you're headed for hell. And thank God for the dispensation of grace that shows up way down in the chart. And we have the sealing of the Holy Ghost of God, which she didn't have right there. They were in a different time period, a different time slot. God was dealing with them in a different way, and he forbade them to eat of the fruit. She disobeyed, and when she disobeyed, she lost the presence of God. Now, she was very much Eve. She had a body, soul, and a spirit, but she didn't have the Spirit of God in her. So technically, she was in darkness. Technically, she needed a Redeemer. So you understand that big black hole that I got in the middle there of this part, sin breaks communion with God. When that's that's going to be innocence runs from the time Adam and Eve show up to the fall. And so I'd have to use this chart again next time because we'll be into the second dispensation and talk about it, which actually starts under the curse and goes on. But the big thing that happened here, and I got a big black old place in there, was the fall of man, the fall of Adam and Eve. 
and God departed. And what did he say? And I probably got this in my note. And God used to walk with them every day in the garden in the cool of the day and talk with them, fellowship with them because he was there. They had communion with him and everything. And they weren't ashamed. They were naked. They walked around. They dressed the trees of the garden and named all the animals, so on and so forth. But after they had sinned, they were hiding. And God said, Adam, where art thou? God knew where he was at. (laughs) Adam might not have known where he was at, but God knew where he was at. So, um, in the beginning, my title of this, Bible Revelation, the Ages, Dispensationalism is a a theological framework, let me put it like that, it divides history into seven different periods of dispensation, so we've seen the first one here in the beginning, of course, was prelude, what was going on before uh, Adam and Eve were formed, once they're formed, first dispensation goes from the time they were created to the fall. Something big happens. Sin shows up. Uh, So here, it divides history into seven different periods, and that's what the chart shows down the wall. Or dispensations, if you please, we're using that term. And describes how God interacts with humanity in each period. And that's what's going on. God dealt with Adam and Eve before the fall, right in here, a little bit different then he's dealing with them over here. You say, why? Over here, they didn't need any shedding of blood and skins of goats or rams or lambs. They hadn't sinned. They were in innocence. But once they sinned, free will of man, now God has to deal with them in a different way. So we've entered a different time period and God dealing with man in a different way. And it begin, that's why somebody says, well, I read over there, uh, over there, I was created in the image of Adam. And so I'm perfect and I'm good. I've never sinned. Why should I be held responsible for some sin Adam did uh, years ago? So I'm created in the image of Adam. Okay, hold up right there. That don't work dispensationally. Adam was created in the image of God. But when he fell, he took on his own will. And now anybody born of Adam after that is created in the image of Adam, not God. You say, oh, how'd you get that? With divisions in the Bible, you weren't born on that side of sin. You're born on this side of sin from a man and a woman who did not have the Spirit of God in them, so you inherited the sinful nature. If you don't get those divisions right, you'll never understand uh, eternal security. You'll never understand uh, Ezekiel chapter 33 where they weren't eternally secure. You say, what? You'll never understand the apparent contradictions where it said you must endure to the end that you might be saved. And over here, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works that he mentioned above. You'll never get that stuff right if you can't see the divisions and how God works with men in different time periods. So it's a good lesson, and we don't have the time to teach in depth on everything, but a lot of this stuff gets taught in Jeremiah's teaching, in Pastor Holt's teaching, and that the blanks get filled in. So let me say this. God interacts with humanity in each period. A little different. The dispensation of innocence is the first, could I say this, the shortest, I believe, period of time. And I don't know exactly how long it was, and I'm not going to try to speculate or guess. But each dispensation or each age, each time period, is said to follow a six-part pattern. Now, this is interesting and more for the serious Bible student than the casual Bible student. Uh, For the dispensation of innocence, the pattern is like this. Number one, there's a pattern in that age, that innocence. The managers of that time period were Adam and Eve. A man had a responsibility, we might say. So the time period... A creation of man to man's temptation and fall. And that would be, number one, he, he's the manager of the garden. Number two, he wasn't supposed to eat of the fruit. He's supposed to take care of things. But he was supposed to obey. That's called responsibility. And he dropped the ball. You know what I'm saying? 
And there's a pattern in this. And that's Ephesians, or Genesis chapter 1, 26. Then there's failure because they disobeyed. Then there's judgment. God has to take over. Curse and death, hence the black hole I drew there. And then there's grace. Don't you ever forget that. Then you're going to have these people jump up and say, well, there, I didn't know there was any grace in the Old Testament. Man, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. What are you talking about? That's for the New Testament even written. Amen. Uh, God's always been a God of grace and mercy. But here there's a seven thing. Number one, he gives you uh, the ability to manage what he gave you. Uh, he gives you responsibility to obey. And then there's either failure or obedience. They failed. Then there's judgment because of the failure, curse and death. Then there's grace. So there's a pattern that shows us forth. Now, not only does it show its forth, self forth in every age or dispensation, or in that dispensation, it shows itself forth in every age and dispensation. Because we live in the dispensation of grace. We're way down the road on this thing. We're in the New Testament. For the sake of teaching, I've got to start in Genesis. Start with number one. But even back there in grace, we have a responsibility. We have been given a mantle to bear. Amen. Uh, and a lot of times we, we do not do that, and then God judges us for it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, all the way through 319. We read of God creating the first people, and I'm probably going to repeat myself just a little because the notes were fresh in my mind. Adam and Eve uh, to live in league or harmony with him in the Garden of Eden. And that's what it was about, for man to have sweet fellowship communion with God day by day. Uh, though having no sin, Genesis 1, 27, Adam and Eve did possess a free will. Because when God created man, it appears that he gave him the free will to make his own judgment. And I know people are going to come along, why did God do that? Why? Look, I can't understand all the awesomeness of God, even as a Bible teacher. All I can tell you is it's a fact, it was done, it's done, and that's how it is. So I never worry myself about what God didn't do. Because people will come to you, what if God would have done this, this, and this, and this? I say, yeah, that's awesome to think about that. But let's get down the things that he really did do and worry about what the responsibilities we really do have. You waste a lot of time worrying about supposition. What if? So here, Adam and Eve did possess free will, the ability to procreate. That's something God handed to man. God created, 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 created. And then he handed to Adam and Eve a responsibility to replenish the earth or populate the earth, if you please. And so now since that time, man has that responsibility. God's not creating any more human beings. Now he knows about it, and he's the giver of the soul, no doubt. And a man now has a body, soul, and a spirit, but he's born lost without the spirit of God, I should say. So... Um, here, a couple more thoughts. Uh, they, were, they were tasked with working the garden. Seen that in Genesis 2.15. Also had a face-to-face -face relationship with God and walked in the garden. Now, not only did they have a face-to-face -face relationship with God, if you look at this chart real well, there is a snake right there. <laughs> they had a face-to-face -face relationship with the serpent. <laughs> and... Uh, of course, that's representation of the devil. He shows up and talks to the serpent and gets them to sin. So when Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, and that's what happened, they introduced sin and death into the world. Take your Bible and go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Now, this verse is probably committed to the memory of most Bible students or teachers or workers says, uh, because we have this deal where we, when we witness to somebody, you know, we'll say, are you saved? Are, do you know where you're going to go when you die? We'll say something like that. And they may look at you in all honesty and integrity and say, no, how could I know that? And that could be a very honest answer. And you ought to be praising God. They're that honest with you. Amen. Because there's a good chance out of that honesty... Once they hear the truth, coupled with the Holy Spirit of God, they might get saved. But if they say something like this, no, who? Me? I, I got, I've always been saved. Man, what are you talking about? I ain't going to hell. I'm going to heaven. But they ain't got the foggiest idea what they're talking about, just some wishful thinking. 
you got your work cut out for you, and you're going to need the Holy Ghost of God to work with that individual. Amen. So in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, say, what's he talking about? Well, the Apostle Paul is writing about the things that happened in Genesis there. And he's giving you a doctrinal platform to understanding what's wrong with mankind. Uh, so, wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, that one man was Adam. That's where it came from. And death by sin, and by the way, the wages of sin is death. You say, well, he didn't die. Didn't he say, in the day that thou eateth that fruit, thou shalt surely die? Yeah, that's what he said. And he didn't die that day. Well, people struggle with that thing, struggle with that thing, struggle with that thing. And Peter said that thing over there where as one day is with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. He lived to 900 and something years old. He didn't make the thousand mark, did he? <laughs> now, I don't know if that work will fly. But let me just throw that out there. He still died and that'd be a physical death. Now, let me assure you of this. As soon as the Holy Ghost of God departed, he was as dead as a dead man can get. Amen and amen and amen. And people can't see that thing because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God uh, for they're spiritual. And man, how can he know them? And so when God departed there in the garden, that man was in darkness. That man was considered lost. That man was without God. So when God shows up looking for Adam, he knew where he was at. He wanted Adam to realize where he was and what he had done. He said, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> Oh, I'm over here doing what I always do. No, you ain't. <laughs> so God had to deal with him differently. You say, what is that? That's the dispensation of innocence ending and the dispensation of uh, the second dispensation beginning. Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll have a name for that next time. Here, Romans 5, 12, which has since been inherited by all people, their innocence was lost, Genesis 3, 7. God announced the consequences of their choice, Genesis 3, 14, 19. Then set a pattern of extending mercy by sacrificing an innocent animal, and that was a lamb. And the time of the blood was shed, provided clothes for Adam and Eve, and God tailored for him himself, Genesis 3, 21. And we see this requirement of a blood sacrifice for atonement throughout the Bible. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission or there's no forgiveness of sins. Now, in his case, that blood couldn't pay for the sin debt, only atone for it until a time. You say, why? Because it, and we only know this because we're in the New Testament able to look back now. It was a representation of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, which before the foundation of the world was a lamb slain that we might be saved. And your Bible all of a sudden begins to start making sense because you see God, how God deals. So, in the dispensation of innocence, God gave people responsibility. That's one of the six things we said would happen. They failed to meet his requirements. They suffered judgment. That's another thing that happens when you disobey God. Then God provided grace and hope for the future, and he always does. People say, oh, I've just sent away the, the day of, of salvation. No, you haven't. Now, you might one day, but right now, let me say to you, God is a gracious God, a long-suffering God, a merciful God. Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. So when people come along and say, well, I'm just too sinful, God can't save me. From Genesis all the way to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, let me assure you, God can save you. Amen. Amen. So here, Genesis 3, 15, um, prophesies, G and you know what, I should give you that verse, because there's a red line that runs through this chart. Right here, after the fall, and after God begins to deal with, with Adam and Eve, and, and set forth a redemptive plan for him through God's grace and mercy, there's a red line that goes all the way through this thing and goes all the way through that chart. If you look at that chart carefully, it goes all the way down through that thing, all the way down through that thing, all the way down through that thing to the cross. And you see it nailed to the cross. 
You say, what is that thing? And I, I'm probably out of time, just about, oh, I am. Let me hurry. Let me give you that verse, Genesis 3. This is too good to leave lay. Genesis chapter 3, look, if you would, at verse, verse 15. Genesis 3, 15. And I want you to see that thing if, if I've got the right verse. In Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 3, 15. And I will put enmity, here it is, between thee and the woman. Watch it. And between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise his head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That seed right there is the promised seed, and that seed right there is that thing found in 1 John where it cannot sin. That seed is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ, which shows up right here uh, when God promised it by his word, and if he gives you his word on that thing, that's as good as settled. And that thing goes all the way through that thing, all the way through, all the way through, all the way through till he died at Calvary and shed the blood that actually pays the sin debt of the world. So let me quit there. Uh, there's a couple other things. Jesus, completely uh, innocent, would die to redeem mankind for those who believed in him, 1 Peter 3, 18. Jesus is described as the last Adam. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. As no further atonement is necessary, and there's nothing else you can do for sin except the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, how'd you get all? Well, it's an understandable way to approach the Bible, a dispensational teaching. As we get this thing off the ground and make a little more sense as we go, you'll see a repetition in it. You'll see that God's always trying to deal with man, that he's always trying to make a way for man. And man, he, he does. He's that kind of God. He's a good God. I recommend him today to that person that's lost and needs to be saved. Shall we? pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for a chance to teach your word. Thank you for uh, an understandable approach to the word of God. I, I pray now that you would bless uh, the scriptures, bless the preaching, bless the singing. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. Amen. God bless you this morning.